Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's debate. My name is Charlie Goodwin, and I'm the chairman, and we'll see is the time picker. The adjudicator is Mrs. France. The topic of this debate is that the new grading policy is detrimental to students. The affirmative team seated to my right is from Pontley Grammar School, and the negative team seated to my left is from Glenunga High School. The speaking time for this debate is four minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time, and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. A continuous bell may be rung 30 seconds after the speaking time, in which the spit case the speaker must sit down immediately. Please switch off your mobile and phones and other electronic devices. I declare this debate open and call upon the first family speaker, Jushi Rothson. Good afternoon, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for our debate is that the new grading policy is detrimental to students. We, the affirmative team, believe that this statement is undeniably true. We define the topic as grading policy, a policy that outlines how levels of achievement will be assessed in an educational institution. New grading policy, a new grading policy for students from preschool to year 12 in the, United, in the Clark County, United States of America, being introduced in the school year 2021 to 2022. And detrimental, tending to cause harm or hindrance and students, a pupil from pre preschool to year 12 in the United States of America. Therefore, in the context of this debate, we define the topic to be that the new grading policy being introduced in Clark County in the USA will cause harm or hindrance to the preschool to year 12 students that it is designed for. We, the affirmative team, believe that this statement is obviously true. Today, as first speaker, I will be talking to you about two points. One, how the approach to deadlines outlined in the new grading policies will inadequately prepare students for their futures outside of the schooling system, and two, how the submission rules for students outlined in the new policy will not make students accountable for their learning and will further erode their organisational skills. Our second speaker will be talking to you about how the timing of this new policy will be a huge strain on teachers, therefore leaving them with less time for quality planning and less time to work with students. He will also speak to you about how redirecting time and resources to this new grading policy will prevent pressing issues negatively affecting students from being dealt with. Our third speaker will rebut and summarize the team case. Now to my first point about how under this new policy, late submission will not attract any consequences. We as the affirmative team believe that this is a serious flaw in the policy and will lead to students being inadequately prepared for the very competitive job market where deadlines must be met. According to a study conducted by Stanford University, having set deadlines can help students in many ways. Deadlines help students with organisational skills because they know what is expected of them and how they can prioritise and organise their time to meet the deadline. Managing complex multi-part projects such as the ones which are common in today's classrooms would become impossible without firm deadlines to keep students on track. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, will the Clark County now remove these rich, informative tasks from their assessment in order to facilitate this non-deadline policy? This would only lead to the dumbing down of the curriculum. So not only does the deadline policy de-skill students' ability to manage time effectively, thus affecting the career chances in later life, but it could also lead to the removal of tasks, which actually challenge students and give them an opportunity to produce something worthwhile. Finally, where is the incentive for the student who works hard to meet the deadline when others are able to submit their work at their pleasure? The answer is, ladies and gentlemen, there is no incentive, and they will also learn that it really doesn't pay to be organised, and without the assistance of deadlines, some won't even get organised enough to submit the work. This leads directly to my second point, which is that students who do absolutely no work at all still get 50% of available marks, although it seems like no one can agree on this part of the policy. Jesus Jara, superintendent of Clark County School District, recently denied that students would receive 50% for non-submitted assignments, saying that missing assignments just wouldn't be calculated within a student's grade. So whatever is actually the case, whether students receive 50% for an assignment that was never submitted, or if they're only handing one assessment piece for the term, this policy is not making students accountable for their learning. In the name of equity, this policy will put students of Clark County behind others by eroding the crucial skills of time management and basic organisation. How is this equitable? So, Mr Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we, the affirmative team, strongly believe that the new grading policy is clearly detrimental to students. Larry Burkett once said, in business, organisation is an absolute necessity, not an alternative. Thank you.
call upon the second primary speaker, sorry, first negative speaker, Trash Tide Purity. Good evening, good evening, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for today's debate is that the new grading policy is detrimental to students. We as a negative team believe this statement to be false. We agree with the definition provided by the affirmative team, but we would also like to elaborate on this definition by saying that the different types of harm could be, that could be caused include mental, physical, social, emotional, and cognitive harm. Since the affirmative team has failed to provide a test, we would like to propose one, that the net bad effects of the new grading policy for it to be deemed detrimental need to be greater than the net benefits. The net effects or criteria of our test include the physical, social, mental, cognitive and emotional factors that students develop through their schooling. Tonight we will show how in the case of each theme, the positive effects outweigh the negatives. I as a first speaker will talk about how this policy will encourage students to develop a sense of self-responsibility and regulation. I will also be informing you on how a student's mental health is positively impacted with the implementation of this new grading policy. Our second speaker, Nitty, will outline how equity results from creating an even and balanced atmosphere for all students to thrive in. Our third speaker, Rohan, will be summing up our team's case and rebutting some vital flaws in the opposition's arguments. Before I set forth my arguments, I would like to rebut the opposing team's case. The first affirmative speaker has stated that the lack of a deadline will have a negative impact on the, on the behaviour of a student, which is not true because it... Um, it encourages students to it encourages students to develop a sense of self responsibility because now now that the deadline is not harshly impact of in, in, enforced on them they have a little bit more freedom this encourages them to think for themselves and make good decisions for their future since if they learn decision making from a very young age that will have a much big, bigger impact on their future than the lack of a deadline would now, moving on to my points. Firstly, the new grading policy executed by the Nevada School District means that students will be graded solely on their academic performance rather than behavioral factors such as attendance, when assignments are submitted, etc. Since handing in assignments late doesn't affect your grades, most people would assume that students will adopt a laid back approach um, and not be as motivated to hand in their work at all. However, this is a very hasty assumption and we should not be obliged to follow this with very little evidence. In fact, due to the flexibility of this new grading system, teachers still have time to adjust and develop these skills within children to help with their future. Linda Cavazos, president of the Clark County Board, School Board of Trustees, further stated that the new policy wouldn't happen overnight and was going to be something that students, parents and staff would acclimate to. Students will not be demotivated and lazier about their assignments, but instead teachers will encourage them to hand it in and educate them on why this is so important as it affects the skills of their future. Furthermore, due to the policy indicating that handing assignments late won't affect their grades, there will be less stress on the students, which leads me to my second point. The new grading policy implemented by the Nevada School District enables students to have more leniency as due dates become flexible and the work is assessed rather than their social abilities and behaviour. A point to note is that the submissions times are still there as indicators as, as to where people should roughly be at with their work. However, if students go past that due date, it won't affect their grades. This takes off additional stress that many students harbour regarding their grades worsening since they didn't, have didn't submit their work on time. Having to work around deadlines, in the words of psychology today, creates stress, kills brain cells, lessens creativity, and that the associated stress can have a debilitating effect on one's mental and physical health. When the stress of late submissions leading to worse grades is taken off students' shoulders, their mental health is improved. This means that the policy is not, in fact, detrimental to students, but quite the opposite. From the arguments I have presented and the points my teammates will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it is blatantly obvious that the new grading policy implemented by the Nevada School District is not detrimental to students. It encourages students to develop a sense of self-responsibility and it also relieves some of the stress students face, which helps improve their mental health. It's an atrocity not to believe in this policy.
I call upon the second affirmative speaker, Jeffrey Wayne. Good afternoon, Chairperson, Adjudicator and other esteemed guests. The topic for tonight's debate is that the new grading policy is detrimental to students. We, as the affirmative team, undoubtedly and passionately believe that this statement is true. The first speaker from the negative team has tried to tell you that this new grading policy will increase responsibility. But how can students increase responsibility when there is literally no incentive to study hard and can in assignments of time due to the removal of deadlines? Removal of deadlines also removes the urgency, responsibility and accountability that comes with assessments. In fact, this new policy can even make already responsible students unresponsible due, to, again, to the lack of incentive to work hard and hand in assignments on time. Her second point was about the fact that this new grading policy would reduce stress. But this new policy would actually reduce the mental health of students, since health in regular amounts actually helps to boost efficiency and quality of work. This is called healthy stress. No stress will actually create apathetic and unstimulated brains, further damaging pupils' mental health. Our first speaker has already talked about how the new system will inadequately prepare students for dealing with deadlines outside of school and how the submission rules would further increase issues relating to organisation and accountability. Today, I will be giving you two convincing points. First is that the new policy would be a huge strain of teachers who are already dealing with COVID impact on education. The Nevada governor's declaration of emergency in response to COVID-19 includes Directive 44, which states that all schools must provide a distance education option for students who cannot or choose not to attend school. Teachers in Nevada are potentially facing the most challenging time of their lives. Some students in front of them and some at home, providing two sets of lessons. It is not hard to realize the workload involved will be enormous. Inevitably, this will filter down to less time to spend on preparation for teaching students or giving intensive feedback to students. It should be as clear as day that students benefit when teachers have time to plan engages, relevant and rigorous curriculum. To add to the huge amount of work this new grading policy will inevitably cause teachers at a time when they're potentially about to experience the most stressful teaching ever will most definitely be to the detriment of the well-being of teachers and to valuable planning time, and therefore most definitely to the detriment of these students. And now to my second point, which is that Clark County District is damaging students by not focusing on things that are practical and important right now. From the multiple of problems that exist in Clark County, I'll be outlining two major issues that are being ignored to enact this detrimental grading policy. First, Clark County District has been found multiple times to not give students enough time to eat during their recess and lunch breaks. Fox 5's interview with a Clark County District teacher shows that students are only allocated 20 minutes to eat lunch and 10 to eat recess. The teachers went as far to say that they, students, were having meltdowns like crazy after school because they were so tired and hungry. Second, CCSD also has a major lack of bus drivers, especially during the pandemic situation. Josh Flurry, in an interview with Fox 5 about the bus driver shortage, stated that my kindergartner was an hour and a half late and did not know what was going on. I was very angry myself. In addition to that, these children are being stranded in the heat of the Nevada summer with no way to get to school. Without a doubt, Clark County District has already enough issues on their plate. And it is detrimental to the students that they are not currently actively attempting to solve these problems of immense magnitude and instead are trying to implement a new grading system that has no proven benefits. In conclusion, the new grading policy is unacceptable to be enacted in Clark County District as the resources first could be used to fix bigger issues in the school community and second, give teachers their deserved rest after working so long in the pandemic environment. Thank you.
I call upon the second negative speaker, Nithai Sob. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Honourable Adjudicator and my esteemed fellow peers. The topic for our debate today is that the new grading policy released by the Nevada School District is detrimental to students. We, the negative side of this debate, know this statement is false. Before I present my arguments, I would like to outline the evident flaws in our opposition stances. The opposition has stated that the value of responsibility would be decreased on students through this policy, but this is on the premise of self-regulation. Many children have parents and teachers that would raise them to be conscious of these deadlines and to value and cherish them to be ethical workers. Additionally, another point that they brought up by our opposition was the fact that the grading policy is being brought upon students and teachers at a rapid pace, which would be a strain on them. As a result, the opposition claimed that this could be a detriment to them as they would not have the appropriate time and resources to adjust to such a big transition. However, Linda Cavazos, president of the Clark County Board, School Board of Trustees, told DailyWire.com that the new policy won't happen overnight and it was going to be something that students, parents, and staff will acclimate to. Cavazos told the outlet that eight schools have already started using this new grading policy and in the ne next few years, students will be able to revise their work for a better grade. This evidence is proof, of, is proof of the contradictory statement made by the opposition and how Nevada's new grading system will, be adapt, will adapt based on the readiness of students and teachers. Continuing on from our first speaker's mental health and self-responsibility related points, I, as a second negative speaker, will be highlighting the most prominent hindrances to, e to equity in education and how the new grading policy can resolve them. The first factor that can cause inequity is the difference in a household's financial standings and stability. According to Tao Lin's research paper on SHNS data, the theory of family investment shows that children who come from more financially stable envi environments <laughs> process many more cognitive developmental resources. Children that come from families that do not have such funds are deprived of these assets, from financial support to basic needs such as family time. Additionally, the Plowden Report focused on the relationships between a student's academic performance, their family background, and school education. This paper broke several stereotypes that the academic record was limited to schooling and aroused the fact that social environments had a pivotal role on students' development. This is where the new grading policy can fix this issue and assist students in overcoming such difficulties. Another factor affecting a student's ability is the behavior and environment that they are exposed to. In the late 20th century, Coleman issued an equality of educational opportunity after investigating the performances of 645,000 students throughout a range of five grades. The results showed that, that family backgrounds are extremely influential on a student's academic performance, with two-thirds of the differences in student achievements containing a link to their respective family and socioeconomic status. That said, ladies and gentlemen, in the United States alone, over 34 million people live under the poverty line. Imagine how many aspiring students are hindered because of their environment at home or in society. The implications for this new policy would be able to correct this by allowing for extra time to complete work with flexible timelines, permitting these students to be able to manage their personal lives, especially considering that they often don't have the essential resources and amenities. Additionally, the environment a student is exposed to can often be dependent on the parental figures in their life. Sadly, for too many students, they do not have a stable parental figure due to a variety of factors, such as long working hours, prolonged or terminal illnesses, or even substance or alcohol abuse. For these students, rather than classical teaching methods, which create a negative relationship between teachers and students due to the, due to the pressure and uncompromising nature of the deadlines, etc., the new grading policy would be better at fostering positive relations between students and teachers. This is because when a, a teacher is permitted to be lenient and empathetic rather than cold and dictatorial, the students will feel more comfortable and are thus more likely to be motivated to complete that work. Thus, to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the new grading system released by the Nevada School District is most definitely not de detrimental to students. In fact, it brings positivity and improvement to these educational systems by inducing the state of equity in schools. It's an atrocity not to believe in this policy.
call upon the third family speaker, Samara Zane. Good evening, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for our debate is that the new grading policy is detrimental to students. We, the affirmative team, believe that this statement is undoubtedly true. The first negative speaker has tried to tell you that teachers will help students who are struggling with work. As our second speaker has talked about, teachers will have less time to work with students because of this grading policy and hence will not be able to care for the whole class, creating a detrimental effect. Is helping only one student out of basically 20 children really helping the majority of students or any students at all? The second negative speaker has tried to tell you that the policy's flaws can be revised and changed. This statement may be correct, however, this debate is on the current policy, not on what it might become in the future. This policy is currently absolutely detrimental to students because of all the points that my teammates have mentioned. Keeping this policy in place will only cause damage to students and should be removed immediately. Keeping it will do no good, even if the flaws were eventually changed. As our second speaker has already mentioned, the timing of this new policy will be a huge strain on teachers, therefore leaving them with less time for quality planning and less time to work with students. The policy will do more damage than good. The best action is to stop this policy as soon as possible. The second speaker also talked about that the new assessment policy makes it fairer for the lower socioeconomic students who might have a lot of pressure on them at, ho on them at home. We believe that there are much better ways of addressing the issues faced by these groups rather than introducing a program that fights inequity experienced by one group by introducing inequity for another. Students who work hard and overcome adversity to hand in high quality work the first time around by the due date are disadvantaged by this policy as it devalues their efforts if other students can have as many chances as they want and submit it when they want. Extension policies and re removing attendance from academic policies could have been trialled first before an entirely new policy which will end up being detrimental to everyone was introduced. They also talked about that students have parents and teachers to help them learn to be responsible. This may be true for some of the students. However, what about the people who don't? Without pressure, healthy pressure, these students will, without a doubt, choose to opt out of finishing their assignments on time. This is not teaching them responsibility. Our first speaker spoke to you about how the approach to deadlines outlined in the new grading policy will inadequately prepare students for the futures outside of the schooling system and how the submission rules for students outlined in the new policy will not make students accountable for their learning and further erode their organisational skills. Our second speaker spoke to you about how the timing of this new policy will be a huge strain on teachers, therefore leaving them with less time for quality planning and less time to work with students. He also spoke about how redirecting time and resources to this new grading policy would prevent pressing issues negatively affecting students from being dealt with. So Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, our team strongly believe that this new grading policy is absolutely detrimental to students and it should be stopped immediately. I call upon the third negative speaker, Anan Kothari. Every day, we work in towards a fairer and more equitable society. So why wouldn't we do the same for our own children's education? However, the new grading policy proposed by the, the, the Nevada School District will accomplish just this. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As our team has already highlighted, contrary to the affirmative side, we firmly believe that the new grading policy introduced in Nevada is not at all detrimental to students. Despite the numerous benefits to the, to the new grading policy that our team has outlined, our opposition still has some reservations. So in my speech today, I will be rebutting some themes of the opposition's case and then going to some specific flaws in their arguments. So tonight, the opposition's arguments have revolved around some key themes 
including the social, cognitive, mental, and emotional struggles that will impact, supposedly, students' futures with the new grading system. Firstly, I would like to look at the social effects within the new grading policy. Our opposition's argument that the new grading system prevents essential life skills like attentiveness, time management, and overall courteous behaviour from developing within students is what I will rebut due to factors such as deadlines. And whilst we agree that these skills should expand and mature over a child's development, we absolutely disfavour even the ideology of how behaviour should suppress grades, which is basically what the opposition is claiming and allowing us to infer. From taking part in extracurricular activities to merely socialising with people we do not know too well. These are a mere two ways of how children can develop essential life skills in a non-school environment. A study from the News Channel today found that particularly boys in elementary school earned lower grades than, would have been, than what would have been based on their test scores, mostly because their teachers held their classroom behaviour against them. Boys get lower grades than what their test scores would suggest, said Jessica Van Paris, a co-author of the study published this month in the Journal of Human Resources. Furthermore, even though social education and behaviour is very important, it shouldn't affect how your academic performance is reported. After all, you just cannot compare apples with oranges. And this is where Nevada's uh, grading system comes into play. Rather than forcing young children to be punished for bad behaviour, such as not meeting deadlines, only to instill good behaviours that will possibly, possibly last throughout the rest of their lives, it is also crucial to understand that you can't just make young children, or children in general, not boisterous with these techniques. So punishing them for something so innate as a desire to be adventurous, adventurously curious is practically trivial. Secondly, I would like to look at the mental effects within the new grading policy, mental and emotional. The opposition have stated that Clark Country, the district, have bad schooling reputations which cause a negative mentality from parents and students alike. However, with this new grading policy, they are trying to fix this and, as clearly stated by our speakers, has multiple benefits. And besides, the opposition has not stated any proof on how this system has no pros, as they have stated. In relation to the theme of cognitive effects on students, the opposition have argued that students will develop bad habits of submitting assignments late and procrastinating. However, who is saying that students are solely wasting time if they submit an assignment late? There are many more concerning reasons, as stated in the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, over half parents work full time. And and this is not just one student out of 20, it's multiple. Therefore, with these external factors, uh, these will allow students to motivate further on the premise of self-regulation. And for those not disadvantaged, it will provide them with a chance to revise for important tests. Therefore, from our points conveyed by my teammates and echoed by myself, it is blatantly obvious that the new grading policy introduced in Nevada will undoubtedly benefit students. As our first speaker has highlighted, the system will develop key life skills such as self-discipline on the premise of regulation, while also creating flexible deadlines to help students' mentality. Additionally, a second speaker has thoroughly explained the equity and equal ground this policy creates. Therefore, the range and diversity of points we have shared today have shown that the criteria of the test for this debate have not been fulfilled, and therefore the new grading policy is not detrimental to students. Ladies and gentlemen, there is practically zero reason to not believe the multitude of benefits Nevada's grading policy will have on the next generations of students. So I would like to leave you with one final message. It's an atrocity to not believe this policy. We now come to question time. For the next three minutes, teams are invited to take turns to ask each other questions about the debate. That is, the affirmative team will ask a question, then the negative team, then the affirmative team, and so on. A team is free to indicate if it has no questions. I now invite the affirmative team to ask a small question. Um, I noticed in your debate that you said that um, these behaviours should not come over academics. Do you mean that? Do you mean to suggest that grades are more important than any other life skills, such as accountability, responsibility, oh. stuff like that? Uh, we aren't saying that. We're just saying behaviour shouldn't be influential in grades. For example, if you get 10 out of 10 in a math test, but you talk in class, your grade shouldn't go from an A plus to a B because you're talking in class. Rather, there should be other precautionary measures to fix this behaviour, such as counselling and other treatment necessary for students 
of the given age. However, in our debate, we didn't outline any issues regarding, say, talking during math class. We were talking about if you had in an assignment late, that was just an example. Be oh, that was just an example. Well, clearly, those two examples aren't on the same magnitude of doing things wrong, as you might put it. But behavior covers a whole like aspect of it. Can cover from. Handing in those, like, as, stated, yeah, as stated in our themes, the social, cognitive, mental, and emotional struggles all encompass this. In, yeah. Additionally, so, just to add on to Han's point, I just wanted to say that obviously there are extracurricular activities and such other activities outside of school that can help nourish a child and bring forth these virtues in their mindsets. We are not saying students should procrastinate and are, uh, it's on the premise of self-regulation as our, as our first speaker mentioned. So there are other measures, as you said, we're, yeah, just that. Um, we have a question for you. So you repeatedly said that there would be no deadlines for the students. Um, did you guys explicitly find this somewhere on like the website or something? Yeah, according to the article that was given in the study by Stanford University. Um, it, it was like, there would be a deadline, but if the deadline's not meet, then it doesn't matter because exactly. we still get a decent grade. So in your argument, you stated that there would be no deadline, so then um, students are allowed to work as late as they want, which is not what we um, what we stated. I, I think I stated that um, the teachers would still encourage students to go by that deadline, but if they go over, it should not be a matter of stress to them, like with their grades going down. It's just um, a guideline as to where they should they should be at. But without like. Because there is like the deadlines not doesn't have to be necessarily met, they're not really given any pressure that's healthy to them, and it doesn't teach them what it feels like to be in a stressful work environment in the future. Like for example, if you work in like a big business corporation and you have to hand up a presentation on time, and you don't do it by the time the meeting is set, you can't just reschedule a whole meeting just so that this one person who hasn't finished their presentation can finish their presentation whenever they want. In this new policy, an, a not enforced deadline is, has the same effect as not having a deadline. With, yeah, uh, with the deadline, we are saying, well, we are saying there should be a deadline, but you have to think about the other factors. So uh, there was a study from um, Foxtel.com in the US, uh, the, uh, sorry, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, and this said that over uh, half of parents work full time jobs, and this forced the children to care for themselves. and put more suppressing priorities, like even making a meal for themselves um, first, rather than doing homework. And this is where the deadlines come in. With the flexible deadline, they can do it at their own leniency and to the best of their standards. We'd also like to state that from a very young age, teachers are supposed to build that, from, uh, will build that foundation within students to like try, try their best to hand it, hand it in at the time. And then, of course, when they grow up and they mature more, they will obviously understand that like meeting deadlines is very important. And since they have that foundation from their very ch um, from their childhood, they will build on that. I'm yeah. pretty sure in one of my rebuttals, I or one of my teammates' rebuttals, we stated that um, this new grading policy is like a completely different grading policy for the students. Like they can't get used to it. There can be like multiple different like mini policies implemented in the current letter grading policy that can actually probably alleviate some of the stresses that people with more responsibilities at home feel because such as like extension policies like asking a teacher like maybe a week before saying oh I have like a really big thing coming up this weekend or like this week and I can't finish this assignment on time can I have another week to do it instead of completely saying oh if you don't hand up the assignment, you can hand it up at the end of this term or the end of this year, and you still oh. get 50%. Firstly, do you have any proof that students will not be able to come to the deadlines? Mm, I mean, I mean, sorry, do you have any proof that students will not be able to uh, be, become accustomed to the new grading policy? I never said they won't be accustomed. I'm just saying that this new grading policy is like a huge leap, like a really, really different thing, and it's like completely changing the guidelines that these students are probably used to. But that doesn't mean that they won't adapt to it. It means that it's probably not the best idea for these schools to change this policy. Um, I just wanted to add, in one of our speeches, um, as my teammates have mentioned, we have mentioned that a person in the article, I can't recall who, they did say that this um, policy will be slowly implemented and it won't happen overnight. So. 
I mean, as yeah. students will get accustomed to it, they'll add new changes, but, which will make it easier for them to get, like... But what happens with that in-between period? Like, what is the entire grading system going to look like? Is it going to be, like, half of the time it's letter grading and half the time it's going to be this completely different one? I'm sorry, but um, I don't understand that. I feel like... Are you Im implying that the letter grading will be totally taken off? Uh, we're at three minutes, thank you, so we're ready for that. We're ready for the adjudicator, Mrs. France, to deliver that feedback. Um, can I have the times, please, Timekeeper? I now invite the uh, adjudicator, <coughs> Mrs. France, forward. Congratulations, everyone, for the finals. Um, I'll just go through everyone individually, um, just for some feedback. Um, oh, first of all, before I do that, um, just sort of a general comment for most of you, spe uh, the speakers, is you all sort of uh, suffered a bit from falling into an essay. Um, the, I'm trying to articulate. Um, what we look for um, 
in the structure of your speeches is what we call signposting. So making it really, really obvious when you're moving on from your rebuttal to your first point, your second point, third point, etc. And uh, it may seem a little bit like condescending speak like to the audience going, here's my first point. Um, but it makes it really, really obvious for people who've never heard your speech before where you are in terms of your structure. And another thing as well is um, what I like to call like a little soundbite introduction. So instead of having a long run-on sentence introducing your points, make it really sharp, really snappy, and get straight to the point of what you're talking about because it's really difficult, especially for me, to write, I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to be critiquing them on here? And I've, I basically have to write like a little paragraph to summarise what you're going to be talking about. So um, third speakers, you will find you, know, you didn't really do it, but the, uh, the other four of you, um, uh, you all sort of did it at one point or another. So make it really, really obvious when you're moving on to your moving through the body of your speech and keep it really short and snappy so everyone knows the gist of what you're talking about and it does a really good job of getting your point across really clearly. Um, but I'll go through all of you individually now. First, affirmative, Joshua. A very good presentation. You were, uh, you were probably talking just a little bit too quickly, but it's nerves, I get it. Uh, your definition was very, very thorough. I really liked the way that you defined everything and then re uh, restated it in a more uh, elaborate way. That was really good. Uh, your points were excellent. Um, right off the bat, talking about how the new policy um, has very lax guideline, uh, deadlines. Sorry. Uh, and because, like I said, with the signposting, I lost a little bit with your second point. Um, and I didn't, were you talking about, was it meant to be like how they'll automatically get 50%? Yeah. Okay. So um, the only thing your point was really needing, like I said, was a really uh, a really short statement talking about that, how you were about to go to your next point. Um, but other than that, it was a very good, really good uh, way to start off the debate, really foundational uh, arguments to have. So that was excellent. Uh, first negative. Trusty, yeah. Uh, very good presentation, very confident, very well spoken, that was excellent. Uh, I liked how you uh, elaborated on the definition and put your own team spin on it. Um, uh, I, think, I think possibly in hindsight, applying that test made, a, made, made not the best idea. I can see why you can do it, but it can sometimes lead into sort of uh, shoehorning in some like rebuttal and the rebuttal not fit perfectly if that makes any sense but i like the style that you did that was very good i don't normally see sort of more thematic interpretations of debates so that was really good to see um your points were very good as well that it's being great at the new policies based on solely academic ability and not like behavior in class that was very good again very uh, foundational argument to have for your team's case and i liked how you spoke that they're more lenient on students as well so you yeah, get very good uh, speech as well. Second, affirmative, Jeffrey. Um, if, we, if we were in an auditorium, that volume would have been great. Um, you could be probably very expressive, I get it. Um, very good eye contact, but I think just a, little, just a little bit quieter for the room you're in. But very good, it's obvious that you're very confident and very comfortable doing this, so that's excellent to see. Your rebuttal was very good, very, um, probably, it was some of the best sort of, what I like to say, ad-libbing ad rebuttal. That was very good to see. Your points are very good. That talked about the strain on teachers and that it can be damaging to students. Again, that was very good, uh, very good points to have. And they're all very substantial, lots of reasoning. So very, very good. Uh, second, negative, needy. Uh, very good presentation, very well spoken as well. That was very good. Uh, your rebuttal was very good. Good use of citations and quotes in there and you showed good background knowledge of this debate and this topic so that was excellent uh your points as well that you spoke about again very important points to be talking about how uh the students financial situations at home can affect their grades um and how normal grading systems don't take that into account and same thing behavioral environmental factors that was very very good things to be talking about uh you you, did, you, you lost some points in terms of your organisation. You were over time. Uh, you were dinged off. And the same thing as well, as soon as you heard the double bell, you started speaking really, 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 really quickly. So um, I think a slightly more... Uh, um, sort of... It's hard to say because you, you don't necessarily know how long your rebuttal is going to be. But um, I think uh, some of your points uh, could have, like, sort of like cut the fat off of some of them, so make them really um, a bit shorter 
and keep it really, really uh, relevant, keeping so you don't necessarily go off onto little tangents. But <coughs> I think at this rate, though, is, is sometimes it's just really hard to keep to the time, especially if you've got a lot of important things that you need to say. Um, but otherwise, it was a very, very good speech. Uh, third, affirmative, Samara. Very good presentation, very confident. Um, your rebuttal was very, very good. Uh, you were very efficient at um, attacking the other team's points on the terms of their relevancy. So you're like, okay, um, they were talking about this, but it's, it's, a, it's kind of a wasted argument because they're talking about this. And I liked uh, what I call concessions. So you're going, you know, the other team said this. Yeah, they might be right, but we reckon this is more important. That's really good to see. Um, and you were very, very thorough. Attacked all of their key points. You did a very, very thorough job at basically annihilating all their points. That was very good. Um, and your summary, again, was very, very good for your team as well. And I liked how you interspersed bits in your rebuttal as well. So that was good. And then third negative, uh -huh. uh, very good presentation, very, very good. I liked your thematic interpretation of a rebuttal. Um, uh, the only thing I'd say, as I said with some of your speech, um, to, your first, to your first negative, um, Whilst it was good to do your thematic, uh, your thematic interpretation, I think uh, just beware to um, attack the opposition's arguments, not just their stance. So was, um, if you look at the big picture, you were sort of standing up going, the team um, is affirmative on this position and this is why that's wrong. You weren't necessarily uh, attacking their specific arguments. Um, so um, whilst your rebuttal was very, very good and very, very thorough, um, it probably wasn't as targeted as it could have been. Um, but other than that, it was very good. You were also over time as well, I think. Um, uh, I think the, um, in cases for the th uh, for third speaker, the best way to do it is just sort of kick rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal until you hear the first bell, then wrap it up, and then go into a summary that should be thoroughly to practice and really thoroughly timed so you know how long it's going to take so you can... Um, avoid getting dinged up. I don't think you heard it, but you were uh, you, the first bell started and you were going to be, it was four minutes 30 exactly. Um, but over the very good presentation as well. It was very close. Um, it was 0.8 of a difference. <laughs> um, but for a quarter final, this is the sort of stuff you expect to see. Um, but I gave the win tonight to the negative team, so congratulations. Um, and I gave speaker of the night, probably unsurprisingly, to first, sorry, second affirmative Jeffrey. <laughs> First, the chairman and timekeeper in this debate. I also like to thank the cameraman for recording the <laughs> entire debate, uh, Miss France for taking note and marking our debate, uh, all our audience members today for watching and supporting our team, the opposing team for putting up such a good fight, congratulations for the win, and finally for Nautilus College for giving us this wonderful venue. Thank you. Okay, so we'd just like to thank everyone present here so, so much. It's been such an amazing journey. And especially Isaac for helping us throughout the way. Just thank you so much, Isaac. You've been so much of a help. Um, all of our team members, we've done so well. And I would love to continue working with you. And it's been such a great journey just overall. We'd like to thank our opposition for putting up such a great argument. It was really fun and challenging debating against you. And we'd like to thank our chairman, timekeeper, and obviously everyone present, and Nazareth for support, like supporting the facilities. Yeah, I'd just like to second that. Thanks, thanks so much, Isaac, for like being you know, amazing. <laughs> and thanks to Will and Johan and Tristy and Nidhi for, I don't know, just being amazing. And yeah, just thanks to the opposition for putting up a really strong debate. Honestly, we didn't think he would win at all. Like, <laughs> we already thought we lost, so just thank you so much. Uh, everyone. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. I declare this debate closed.